or any thoughts or any statements. Audience, it's in the description for you guys here. It's on the screen. And so most of you know that we say it out loud together, and I'll lead, and I think Jim's going to lead the repeat. Okay. Since Greg's not here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Show me what you want me to know. Show me what you want me to know. Jesus, show me what you want me to do. And Jesus, show me what you want me to stop doing. Jesus, show me what you want me to stop doing. I will be a doer of your word. I will be a doer of your word. And not just a hearer. And not just a hearer. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, so you guys got to uh, experience the song that I talked about last week, right? I'm crazy about you. So this is the song that uh, God spoke to me at 4 a.m. with last Sunday. It's just precious. Anyway, uh, one of the things I love about that song is that Torn Wells, the writer and singer of that song, actually understands salvation. We think that there are really deep things in the Bible, but the deepest thing in the Bible, honestly, is salvation. You, you can't explain it. You can't wrap your head around it. You just receive it. But do you notice the way he says that he's paid for all of this 10 million times, right? That's because we keep thinking we have to do something to achieve it. You don't achieve it. You just receive it. And when you receive it, it's done. It's finished. Amen. It's complete. It's, yes. it's the new covenant. And uh, when you... <laughs> that, that's what I love about that song. That's what I love about Tarn Wells. He's one of those artists that get it. They understand. And um, so that's why that song speaks to me so much. I've watched a podcast of his a couple of times, and it's really good. He dives deep in the Bible. Any of you know who Skillet is? You know, uh, John, uh, what's his name? Anyway, I forget. I watch his podcast a lot, too. Those are two singers who are theologically and spiritually on point, even though they look light years apart from one another. It just goes to show it's not about the package. It's about what's in the package, Amen. right? Uh, John Cooper. Anyway, um, this morning, I, I thought this week, Father, what do you want me to preach on? What do you want me to speak about this week? What, how do we, what do we need to hear from you? And all I heard all week long was prayer, 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 prayer. And I couldn't figure out how to come at it. And uh, whenever you can't figure out how to come at something, just open the Word and let it do it for you. So I'm going to read a couple of prayers this morning that David prays. David is always raw, which is what our prayers need to be. You know, many of us have grown up some of us have grown up in churches, some of us have not, um, and we're used to usually hearing polished prayers, and we often think, I could never pray like that. Well, honestly, polished prayers are not all that there is. In fact, that's a fraction of the prayers. Some people are gifted with words, some people are not. God doesn't care about your polish on your words. Amen. He wants to hear your words from your heart. And David was really, really good at it. Jesus also was really good at it. The, it's the funny thing about uh, when I watch The Chosen, I always get a kick out of it because they pick up on this because people, when they're afraid, they don't, they don't know how to pray. And then Jesus comes along and says, pray like this. In the chosen, what you see is they pray the same prayer every time they get together. It's like, and that's fine, but is that your heart? 
right? Because the fact is God wants your heart. That's the whole point of salvation. So is he getting your words lined up with your heart? Okay? So we're going to get into this a little bit. Chapter 71 of Psalms is a prayer. Chapter 72 of Psalms is a prayer. What's going on in chapter 71 is David has two of his sons that are trying to become king before David dies. David hasn't blessed them in this way. He's actually told everybody that Solomon was going to be king. And these two sons have decided that they're going to become king. And one of them uh, throws a big party for himself and gets the priests on his side and says, let's do this and let's do that, and I'm going to become king. David is still king. David is old. David is gray. David is not in good health. But David is still king. And this is not the way David's family is supposed to be doing this. The one who is the rightful heir is just being quiet. And then the one that's good-looking and uh, full of life and full of vim and vigor, which means he drank Dr. Pepper probably, uh, the reality is he thought he was everything. And he was going to take it by force. And so he got a couple of commanders on his side, and by golly, he was going to take it by force. And this prayer that we're fixing to read is interesting because David loves his sons, but he does not want them to die. Usually in this kind of a situation, the first thing a king would do if their sons rose up like this, they'd just have them executed. David is not like the typical king. He wants them to learn. So I want you to watch his prayer, and I want you to watch how he prays. Verse 1, O Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me and rescue me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to listen to me and set me free. Be my rock of safety where I can always hide. Give the order to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. My God, rescue me from the power of the wicked from the clutches of cruel oppressors. O Lord, you alone are my hope. I've trusted you, O Lord, from childhood. Yes, you have been with me from my birth. From my mother's womb, you have cared for me. No wonder I am always praising you. Now, what does he call his sons here? Oppressors. He calls them wicked. Have you, have you ever prayed for somebody that you love and you use those kind of words on them? Let me ask you a question. Before we came to Christ, what were we? Wicked. We were oppressors of the truth. People would say, let me tell you about Jesus. I, I don't want to hear it. That's an oppressor of the truth. Just stop and think about that a minute. That shows you how far we are from God before we come to him through Christ, right? He's using words here that I would not call my children, but their behavior is exactly that. But then he says, you alone are my hope. I've trusted in you from childhood. Now, David has had a unique experience. Many of us in this room do not have this experience. But David had it. His parents were righteous. His parents did the right things. His parents prayed. They offered sacrifices. They took the kids to synagogue. They did all the things they were supposed to do to put them in the perfect learning environment. And David, here's the crazy part, all of his brothers couldn't pray this prayer, but he could pray this prayer. Because when Samuel came to anoint him as king, where was David? Out in the field being a shepherd. 
See, God refers to himself as a shepherd all over the Old Testament. David can line up with this shepherding thing because he did it. And then at night when he watched the stars raise, he knew God did that because of all of the training he had had. All of the love and attention that he had had through his parents who did this to all the kids, but David is the one who got it. How do I know that? Because the day that David went and said, why is that uncircumcised Philistine yelling at all of us? And why are you guys cowering over here? I can kill him. And what did his brothers say? Oh, you're so full of yourself. That gives you a window into how they thought. Was he full of himself? No. Within about an hour, there was a dead Philistine over there, and they had just routed the army. He wasn't full of himself. He was full of God, and he recognized that right? He says, I have, I have trusted you from my childhood. Yes, you've been with me from my birth, from my mother's womb. You have cared for me. You know, we don't realize it, but even if we weren't raised in church, even if we weren't raised around godly people, actually, God did that for us too. When we were in the womb, we knew God's presence. When we got out of the womb, we knew the presence of our parents. And if they sowed good things in us, we continued to know that. If they didn't and or if we were rejected, then that's where we started going sideways, right? But what's crazy is, as I was explaining to somebody in the first service, but what's crazy is, is even our ability to come to Christ comes through God already nurturing us towards Him. It comes through the Holy Spirit actually drawing us to Him. Have you ever thought, man, if I just had enough faith, I'd trust Christ? You don't have enough faith. You never did. The faith that you have to have to believe is already coming from God. God is already doing it. Have you ever wondered when you, you hear a certain sermon or you, you hear a song or something and all of a sudden your spirit goes, what? What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. That's not you. It's already connecting, right? I don't know if you're like me, but I, I was raised in church, but I was pretty rebellious. It was really hard to rein me in a lot. That's why my dad sent me to a farm from a farmer down the street. And so every summer, I worked on a farm. And let me tell you there, you do the same thing over and over, and it'll wear you down, and you don't have time to be too rebellious, right? But when I got a little older, I started, my rebellion really started coming out. But I'll never forget one day, we were doing something stupid in our cars when I was a teenager, and all of a sudden there was this wreck in front of us. And they were like, well, let's get on and go. Let's get on and go do what we're going to do. And I said, drop me off. They dropped me out of the car. I went to the wreck. They went on to go whatever stupid thing they were going to do. Holy Spirit was already working in me, even in my rebelliousness. And he said, help them. And my knucklehead friends didn't do nothing. They were all about themselves, right? In that moment, I had a choice. And in that choice... I chose to help the people in the wreck. That's what differentiated me from those guys my whole life. Even though I made some stupid mistakes and even though I followed my own way sometimes, that God was still doing that. Yeah. Now, is that, is that Jim Yeager or is that the Spirit of God on him, right? What is protected of you that have lived a rough life? What has protected you your whole life? I was hoping somebody would say me so I could go, really? <laughs> because the reality is it ain't you. Can you make your heart stop beating, start beating again after it stopped? Brian? Can, can you all of a sudden be out of a situation and you don't know how it happened and you should be dead, but here you are standing here and you go, what just happened? Can you make yourself breathe again? When 
the Spirit of God is working on us just like he is with David. It's just that David had this unique situation, and I believe it's because he was set up to be the king of Israel in a way that mimicked what Jesus will rule like in the millennium. He's a picture of that. Right? Now watch this. My life is an example to many because you have been my strength and my protection. That is why I can never stop praising you. I declare your glory all day long. And now in my old age, don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when my strength is failing. For my enemies are whispering against me. They are plotting together to kill me. They say God has abandoned him. Let's go and get him. For no one will help him now. See, that's the thing that can happen as we get older. We can get afraid. That's the thing that can happen if we stray far from God at any point. We can get afraid. Why is that? It's because we're trying to control the outcome. We're, we're trying to figure out how things are working. How do I need to do this and that? And David's body was starting to fail him. When he comes back from this, there's actually a young lady starts sleeping with him on a regular basis. I know it sounds weird, but it was a cultural thing. And she was a virgin, and it wasn't about having sex. It was about her metabolism creates more heat under the sheets. And she would sleep with him to keep him warm because when you're old and frail, you shake sometimes. And you go... Well, that's basically this. He's almost to that point when he prays this prayer. And they say God has abandoned him. Why? Because his strength had started to fail. The human body can only take so much. We forget, when we see King David, we forget that this guy has killed tens of thousands of people with a sword. This is a guy who was rough and rugged big enough to defend himself, could deal with any problem right in front of him. But there's a time in our lives when we're down and on our back and we can't be that anymore. Does that mean God has abandoned you or left you? You know what Michelle told me when I was in the, the mid point of the hardest chemo I'd ever done? She said, Jim, you're going to have to learn to fight a different way. I couldn't, I couldn't fight the way I did before. Before I could just toughen up and just, oh, I'm going to do this. I'd, I'd always say I'd just bow my head and go into it. Like, you know, I played football a long time, not with pads. I played till I was 30-year-old sandlot, full contact. And let me tell you what, nobody wanted to get in front of me because I would run you over head first. And they were like, golly, you hit so dang hard, Jim. I said, you know, and then I put pads on and I'm a weenie. I never understood that. But I'm going to tell you what, that's the way I did life. But then when you can't do that, how do you do life? You have to rely on God's strength. That's what David is saying. Oh, God, don't stay away from me, verse 12. My God, please hurry to help me. Bring disgrace and destruction on my accusers, humiliate and shame those who want to harm me, but I will keep on hoping for your help. I will praise you more and more. I will tell everyone about your righteousness all day long. I will proclaim your saving power. Though I am not skilled with words, I will praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. I will tell everyone that you alone are just. Now the crazy part of this is David did this his whole life. This, is what, this isn't anything new for him. He had done this his whole life. Do you know how many times when him and his mighty 30 are out there running away from Saul and trying not to get caught because Saul was after him all the time, how many times they would be in a severe predicament and the guys would go, well, let's just rise up and kick butt and take names. And David would say, no, we're going to pray. And they'd go, oh, here we go. If you read it enough, you, it's not in Scripture that they do that, but I can see it. And I can say, oh, here we go with that crazy man again. And he would pray. It doesn't say they prayed. It said he prayed. And he prayed in front of them 
regardless of what their belief system was. He prayed in front of them, and they saw it every time. And then what they saw was the way to rout or escape the enemy because God would give him a plan. What verse did I stop on? 16. Oh God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. Now that I'm old and gray, do not abandon me, oh God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation. Now you see the heart of the matter. Your, my, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. I don't know if you've noticed this, but did you see that he doesn't really want his boys to be killed? He wants them to be shamed. He wants them to be humiliated. You know why he wants that instead of death? Because so they'll learn, so that they can repent from it. What does he tell, I think it's Joab, what does he tell Joab? He says, please, whatever you do, do not kill my son Absalom. When Absalom is hanging by his hair because the mule ran out from under him, when he gets caught in a tree, and then I uh, forget the first runner that finds him, and he goes and tells Joab, and Joab goes, kill him. He goes, David asks us not to, and Joab throws, walks up there and throws a spear in him. And he goes, you're not supposed to do that. He goes, if we're not killing him today, we'll kill him tomorrow, because this kid ain't going to stop. He actually wanted them to repent. Joab didn't allow that, which is one of the reasons from that day forward, David didn't trust Joab anymore. There's a lot going on there. Your righteousness, O God, reaches to the highest heavens. You have done such wonderful things. Who can compare with you, O God? You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore my life to, uh, restore me to life again. And lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me even to greater honor and comfort me once again. Then I will praise you with music on the heart because you are faithful to your promises, O my God. I will sing praises to you with a lyre, O holy one of Israel. I will shout for joy and sing your praises. For you have ransomed me. I will tell you about your righteous deeds all day long. For everyone who tried to hurt me has been shamed and humiliated. Now did you notice... There's a point in which in David's prayers that all he's doing is praising God. See, what happens is, is the Holy Spirit, once, once we start praying in line with the Holy Spirit, what happens then is then we get so focused on God that our problems start to drift off. And as those problems start to drift off, off our trust gets bigger and bigger towards God. And then when we do that, we're on a whole nother level. Now what's interesting is, is David never gets physically better. But David died, and what do you think he's doing in heaven? He's doing all these things he just said. He is playing the liar. He is playing. You know, I think it's interesting. David, uh, there's a lot of musicians that say that David played with a secret chord. I don't know if you've ever heard that. But there are many musicians who say that David was probably one of the best harp players or guitar players that there ever was. And it's because he was intuitive to God with it. It makes me wonder if David will actually play instruments in heaven. Because sometimes some of our gifting and abilities on earth will be the same in the kingdom. Just stop and think about that. So this is almost, he's almost prophesying over himself now in his next life. I want you to see the progression of this prayer. It starts out, me, 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 and then goes to them, 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 me, them, me, them. Please don't kill them. Let them repent. And then it ends up, thank you, God, 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 thank you. You want to see a pattern of how you should pray? This is pretty simple. But do you notice the words are raw? Do you notice David says, my words aren't the greatest? 
But why is one of the greatest comforts in the Bible all Psalms? <laughs> because he's even humble in that. He recognizes that those words are coming from God. You know? You know, one of the most fascinating things to me is when people tell me, sometime later in the week, sometimes a month, sometimes 10 years later, I've heard people say, you know, something that changed my life is something you said in a sermon. And I go, what? It's not about me. And they go, no, it's the way you said it. Well, what does that tell you? It wasn't me. God speaking through me, or God just using the fact that they are in the building or they're in the conversation, and he speaks something directly to their brain that never even came out of my mouth. It was because they were present with God. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. It's me and them, spiritually together, or you and somebody else, and something's spoken, and it speaks to the depths of who you are. And what do we know when that happens? God just showed up. Some people say, but I've never heard from God. If you've ever had that experience, you heard from God. Am I right? Now, let's look at this next prayer. This is 72. Verse 1, give your love of justice to the king, O God, and righteousness to the king's son. Help him judge the people, your people, in the right way. Let the poor always be treated fairly. May the mountains yield prosperity for all, and may the hills be fruitful. Help him to defend the poor, to rescue the children of the needy, and to crush their oppressors. May they fear you as long as the sun shines, as long as the moon remains in the sky, yes, forever. May the king's rule be refreshing like spring like spring rain on freshly cut grass, like the showers that water the earth. May all the godly flourish, flourish during his reign. May there be abundant prosperity until the moon is no more. May he reign from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. Desert nomads will bow before him. His enemies will fall before him in the dust. The western kings of Tarshish and other distant lands will bring him tribute. The, king, the eastern kings of Sheba and Seba will bring him gifts. All kings will bow before him, and all nations will serve him. Who's he praying for? The, Solomon. It sounds like in the first verse, the first half of the verse, he's praying for himself, but then you see it's actually for his son Solomon. And look at what he prays. Now, when, you, when we've studied Solomon in the past through reading through um, Samuel and Kings, and I've talked about this before, it looks like God is just all over Solomon right off the bat, right? I wonder why that is. His daddy has prayed all of these prayers over him, and all of them came true. This isn't just hoping for his son. It's praying for his son. It's interceding for his son. And we actually, when you see the story of Solomon, all these things are true. Now, the problem with Solomon is at one point he lets it go to his head, and then the catastrophe starts. But it's not for the sake of his dad praying over him and his mother. What have I told you about Proverbs 31? That's, that's what a Proverbs 31 woman is supposed to look like, a godly woman is supposed to look like. But if you read Proverbs 31, you realize Solomon wouldn't have had all the problems he had if that was proverb number one. And you actually realize that it's a letter from his mother. And she's warning him. So his dad interceded for him. His mother wrote a proverb and warned him. It wasn't for lack of them doing their responsibilities, right? But there's a point in which we as adults come out from under their covering or their blessing. And then we become whatever we're going to become. Now, Solomon, before the end, looks like he turns around. He writes some stuff that makes him look like he turns around, which is good. 
But when you see his sons, his sons didn't do very good, which makes you think that maybe they didn't pay attention. Now watch this. May the king's rule be refreshing. No, did that. Verse 12. No. What verse? 12. He, rescue, he will rescue the poor when they cry to him. He will help the oppressed who have no one to defend them. He feels pity for the weak and the needy, and he will rescue them. He will redeem them from oppression and violence, for their lives are precious to him. Now, that's fun to me. Solomon was never a shepherd, but he was a spiritual shepherd. David, however, was a shepherd, and he understood this. So he's praying a prayer for Solomon from a shepherd's perspective. And then Jesus is considered the good shepherd, and Jesus prays as if he's a shepherd, and he prays for the disciples as if they're going to be shepherds, right? Very interesting. Long live the king. May the gold of Sheba be given to him. May the people always pray for him and bless him all day long. May there be abundant grain throughout the land, flourishing even on the hilltops. May the fruit, fruit trees flourish like the trees of Lebanon, and may the people thrive like grass in a field. May the king's name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun shines. May all nations be blessed through him and bring him praise. Praise the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does such wonderful things. Praise his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Isn't that a beautiful prayer? Now, did you notice that he prayed blessings over his son and the people who would be under his rule? How does this prayer, how does this prayer differ from the first one? It's all about somebody else. So one is a prayer for himself. Some people would say it's selfish. I don't think there's a selfish prayer when we're in it with God. Now, a selfish prayer would be, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. Basically, give me what I want like a big genie in the sky, and oh, by the way, I may, you know, talk to you next week, next month, next year. That's a selfish prayer. But what's crazy is, is if we'll start praying, our prayers will turn into intercessory prayers. Because after God starts answering these prayers that we pray, the Holy Spirit will remind us that other people need this too, and then you start interceding for people and you start praying for people because of what you want to see God do for them because if we're true followers of Christ what was the two rules he said the new two commandments love the Lord your God with all your heart mind soul and strength love your neighbor as yourself how do you love your neighbor as yourself you want as good of things for the neighbors if God has given you And in other words, there's a point in which we pray for others because that's what the Spirit wants. There's only so much stuff you can get, right? There's only, I'm not going to say so many blessings because what happens is at some point the blessings that come from God start coming through you to other people because that's the way the Spirit worked with Jesus. Jesus came as the world's greatest leader, only he showed up to a few fishermen and a bunch of rejects. And then he started healing people, and the world caught notice of all the healing, and they go, I want that, I want that, I want that. And he goes, well, then follow me. And they go, well, we don't want to become a peasant. But then the disciples when they, read the re when they write the rest of the New Testament, you, you see nothing but joy on them. Well, as we read that, that encourages us, and then it makes me think, I really want joy in my salvation. I don't want what the world has to offer anyway. And then the stuff don't even matter. And then you just want what God wants. And what does God want? Loving relationship. Loving relationship. 
with him and with others. You've read this book, haven't you? <laughs> I love it, Noah. Manoah. Okay, so the reason I bring all this up is because yesterday I had a prayer answered, a big prayer. Now, because the weather got so cold and hunting season actually still lasts till tomorrow, but I am not going to sit out in this weather and wait for an animal that may not show up for five hours. For five hours. And I, so I collected all my blinds yesterday and said, that's it. Friday night was our last hunt. But God showed me something. You know, when I got the diagnosis for this last round of whatever the devil thinks he's doing, I prayed a bullet prayer that day. And you know what that bullet prayer was? This is how it went. The doctor says, blah, 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 blah. And I go, okay. What do you want to do? Nothing. What? Nothing. And then we got up from our seats, we walked out of the room, and I went, Father, am I going to get to hunt one more season? And I no more got the words out, and I heard, yes. Now, check this out. That was 10 months ago, 10 and a half months ago, when most people were already, that weren't here, but knew about me, were already putting me in the grave. By the way, I ran into somebody yesterday, and they looked at me with shock because they had heard I was already dead. And I laughed out loud and thought, oh, that's funny. Because I've been a carpenter my whole life, and in construction, you laugh about stuff like that. I'm sorry if that seems morbid, but that's just the way we do it. And so I just laughed, and I went, oh, that's funny. I bet you thought you saw a ghost. No wonder you looked the way you did and then they were like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> but what's fun is, is God answered that bullet prayer, that, check this out, that selfish little prayer that really doesn't mean anything. But he answered that prayer. Now, if he answered that prayer, how much more does he want to answer the big prayers that have to do with you or the world? Because those things Jesus died for. Jesus didn't die so I could hunt. Or did he die for everything that I'm interested in as long as it lines up with him. Just think about that. The reason, the reason this sermon came about is because I've, I feel like the Spirit has been taking our church on a journey since COVID. We basically restarted. We shed... He shed our church of a lot of takers. And he deepened the roots of those who are not takers but are givers who just want to follow God with all their heart. And then he's brought some new people along who are going, okay, I want to see what this Jesus thing is all about. And I'm seeing them get saved and I'm seeing them turn and change and then I'm seeing people go, okay, what's next? Well, what's next is other people. And I'm not talking about growing our church. I'm talking about growing the kingdom. And what that is, is, is sharing our faith and interceding for one another and being the church to the world. You know, we are in a time right now that is a pivot point in American society. If the church needs to be doing anything right now, it's praying, right? And so praying is for us, and it's for such a time as this. Just like Esther was queen 
for a reason in Xerxes' kingdom for such a time as that. We are here to pray for such a time as this. But it's not a really about America. It's not really about the United States. It's about the kingdom of God. And David has all of this thanksgiving for all that God did, and he was interested in the kingdom of heaven as well as the kingdom of Israel. Well, Israel is no longer a kingdom, but those prayers are still being answered. The United States of America is not a kingdom, but those prayers can still be answered. And so I feel like what God is saying is, through that prayer that he answered for me and then given me this sermon this morning is, I want us as church and as individuals to start praying for people outside of our own household. Still pray those prayers, but let's start praying for those outside of that household. Let's start praying for our neighbors. Let's start praying for, for goodness sake, even with the situation with all these illegal immigrants, they still need Jesus. And somehow, some way, how do we do both things? How do we try to enforce our laws, but how do we also share the gospel? How do we love people that are taking advantage? At the same time, how do we love, period? What does that look like? I don't know. But if we pray, and if we ask God, and if he'll answer a prayer like, am I going to get to hunt this year? Then he's going to answer all of them. I don't know if you noticed, but in this prayer of David over Solomon, God answered every one of those lines, line by line, that he prayed. God answered every one of those. Because David was a man after God's own heart, which means he was raw with God. He talked with God just where he was. Whatever was going on, that's what he talked about. And then he would always end the prayer with praising God for all that he had done throughout his lifetime, right? Which is thanksgiving. When we do those things, God shows up because it lines up with his will. Be thinking about these things as we go into this time of reflection. And thank you for weather in this cold weather. And for those of you online, it's okay. No shame. We don't think any less of you. You need to pray just like the rest of us are going to pray. All right?